Hey everyone, um, I hope this is working. I saw that two people added a comment. <laughs> so um, if one of you wants to... Um, um, is this working? Let's see. Anyway, um, I hope it is. Um, welcome to this um, Hangout on Air or Happy Folding on Air. Um, it'll be a bit of an adventure. Um, as I mentioned, I'm just going to be answering some questions. Felix is asleep and hopefully he's going to sleep through this. <laughs> but if not, um, you know, I might have to dash off. Uh, that's kind of part of being a mommy. Um, and apparently it is working. So that's great. Um, so I do have a couple of questions that were en entered into the moderator page. Um, and how about I just start with those? And they're ranked kind of by how many people upvoted them. And I did look through them. But um, if you're watching right now um, and you want to uh, kind of add comments with questions, whatever, um, then, you know, I can... Uh, read through them and kind of take those live questions. I also had uh, one person email me asking whether they could um, ask me a question on video, so someone might uh, tune in as we go along. Um, so I'm just going to go through these questions and uh, I, I have to admit I can't answer all of them and I didn't really have time to prepare this at all, so I didn't really have much time to think about it either. So um, the first question comes from Connor in Seattle, um, and uh, Connor asks, uh, I was uh, wondering if you could tell me how to prepare Thai um, Anryo, or Anryo, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, paper. It always seems to never work out. Um, and the truth is, I haven't really worked with the paper. Um, I'm not sure whether... Um, I, I think I do have paper here, um, but I haven't I haven't actually worked with it. <laughs> so I um, I buy a lot of paper, and right now I don't have a lot of time, so um, I haven't had the time to try it out yet. I I don't think I've had it. Um, I had it before um, Felix was born. Actually, I'm not quite sure. Um, so I haven't tried, but um, the recommendation I read was to uh, use it for um, tissue foil. So you kind of adhere it to some foil paper um, with some white glue, and then you fold with that. And I think that's probably worth a try. I'm not sure whether Connor tried that and it didn't work out so well, um, or whether perhaps... Um, uh, Connor, I'm not sure it could be male or female. I'm going to say he. So if if you're a woman, I apologize. So um, maybe he also tried um, adding um, MC or, or something like that and it didn't work out so well. I'm not sure. I think usually uh, you can see the fibers of the paper quite well. Um, and maybe that's causing some difficulties. Um, I can quickly check. I think so I think um, and I'm not 100% sure but I think this is the kind of paper um, that Connor is talking about and I'm not sure whether this is going to focus enough but you can see uh, very clearly um, fibers, paper fibers. And that can sometimes cause difficulties um, when folding because the, papers, um, the paper has a different thickness um, when there's these obvious fibers. It's beautiful, but it can cause some difficulties. Um, and I think if you um, use it for tissue foil, the foil component is kind of going to um, remove the difficulties you might have with it because the foil is going to be the most important aspect 
you know, with respect to the folding quality. So like the foil is kind of very stiff and, um, and that's going to take the upper hand whereas the paper of tissue foil kind of adds that security that um, you don't have when you have tissue by itself because it drips very easily. If you have a small rip in um, foil uh, without any paper component, it's just going to rip all the way and it's going to be very bad. Um, but when you kind of have both the paper component and the foil component, then um, in my experience at least, uh, you kind of have that advantage of paper not ripping as easily, but you also have that very stiff character um, of, of foil. So my best guess is if it doesn't work so well uh, with um, after treating with um, methyl cellulose, then perhaps try to use it for um, tissue foil. And I do know that people have folded um, with this kind of paper um, for uh, tissue foil and have had amazing results. Um, personally, I prefer not folding with foil actually, um, but using it purely. And I have, I think, once folded with this kind of paper um, with a test sheet that um, was in one of the um, orders I got from um, Nicolas Terry. And um, it was a beautiful model, and um, I didn't treat the paper at all, but it was relatively soft um, in terms of origami paper. Um, so I, I would have said, yeah, probably I'd try to add some glue so that um, it's a bit stiffer. I'm seeing that there's a lot of reflections, so I'm half blind without glasses, but maybe it's going to work out anyway. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure whether that answered the question because mostly I'm just saying um, I'm don't, I don't know, but um, m maybe just try um, adding it to foil and um, perhaps that works better. Okay, so that was probably quite a longish answer, but hey. Um, I was wondering if you could help me figure out the ratio for a methyl cellulose to water for double tissue, and that's Connor again. Um, so maybe you tried um, actually doing double tissue um, with the, the un, Unreal or however you pronounce the paper. And um, I don't have um, a, a real answer for that. I think, uh, I've, first of all, I've never worked with MC Pure. I've always kind of used this wallpaper glue. And um, and in that case, and um, actually, what I do is just see, yeah, got it there. So what I actually do is I kind of prepare this thick uh, mixture, kind of just add water, add some of the pulp. Uh, the it's like on pulver form, what I use in powder form. Sorry, uh, pulver is German for powder. <laughs> um, and then I just shake it so that it gets um, mixed up very, very well. But then there's air bubbles in there and then I just let it rest so that all the air bubbles, they kind of rise to the top. And then when I actually want to prepare some paper, I have this thick mix mixture and I pour it into um, a small cup or something and I thin it down with water until it has the right consistency. And uh, the consistency um, that um, uh, Anna Kastlunger and Gavin Sprung, who first showed me how to do um, double tissue, they kind of gave this advice of go for uh, the consistency of egg white. And um, I personally have to say, I think I, I make it a little bit thinner than uh, the consistency of, of egg white, but that's kind of perhaps a good, um, um, a good point of reference. So, um, and then, you know, if I um, don't have enough water in there, I can just thin it down a little more. And if, um, if I put in too much water, I can just let it rest because over time the water is going to slowly evaporate. Or I just um, add a bit more of the, the thick mixture. And this mixture actually has rested, you know, for a long time. 
And right now it actually looks relatively thin, which um, I'm a bit surprised by because I would have thought that um, it gets thicker and thicker with time. But, you know, it's, it's closed, so um, I guess the moisture always feeds back <laughs> into the mixture. So this has, you know, this, this glass mm, I perhaps prepared two years ago or so. Um, so it's very good for storage and it's, it's very easy then to make some paper. But of course with W tissue it's going to take a while to dry. Um, I probably suggest that because every glue is a little different, that um, you try a consistency that you think might work and then um, you just um, make some paper and if you're happy with the result, good. If you think it's not stiff enough, make it a bit thicker mixture. If you uh, think um, it's kind of uh, the paper got too thick and too crisp, uh, then make it a little thinner next time and you can kind of start a small experiment yourself. Um, or you could do like a whole batch of like five sheets next to each other, try different mixtures and then compare all of them, um, going like the scientific route, which I'm all for. <laughs> um, and, um, and then try to find out what works best for you because um, with, with origami, like paper is, is a lot, um, it's a lot about what you prefer. There's like not the one exact right paper or the one exact right mixture, it's, it's what you like. I will add here that if you, um, if, um, if you do double tissue, you have two sheets of paper and if they don't actually stick together, there can be two problems, I guess. The first one is um, the mixture is so thick that um, it actually didn't soak through the first paper to go through to the second paper and that's why they don't stick together. Um, I think that's a very uncommon problem. I think the more common problem is that um, the tissue um, or the paper that you're using for a double tissue um, doesn't, uh, well it kind of soaks in water but it doesn't really let it through and in that case it's better to like not have two um, sheets of tissue and then have the water drift through or the, the glue mixture drift through to the second sheet but you actually have one sheet then you add the glue and then on top of it you put the second sheet. It's a bit more work um, but that's actually the the way that Michael LaFosse recommends you do double tissue um, and I guess for good reason. Um, now the the main reason, I think, um, or the main difference in tissues um, for whether it works or not with kind of having the simple method of two tissue, um, uh, sheets of tissue and then the glue soaking through is that if you have non-bleeding tissue, which is in some ways really very good because um, it doesn't lose color when it gets wet, that's why it's called non-bleeding, um, that means, you know, if it doesn't, uh, if, if it doesn't lose color when it's wet, it also means it usually doesn't take in water as easily and the water doesn't soak through as easily and the glue doesn't soak through as easily. So it's going to be more difficult to glue together. Whereas when you have bleeding tissue, which is what I usually work with, then um, the, um, the chances are that it's going to soak through very easily and it's going to stick together very easily. Um, very often when you buy this stuff, it doesn't say whether it's bleeding or non-bleeding. So it's kind of a trial and error thing again. Um, it depends. Sometimes you can ask. Um, and I found that in Germany, most tissue is bleeding. And um, in, in the US, I guess, most is non-bleeding. So if you... Um, uh, if you if you just grab some tissue, um, it depends on where you live, whether it's probably bleeding or non-bleeding tissue. And uh, the, the, pro, uh, the advantage of uh, non-bleeding tissue is also it's much easier to do duo color um, uh, double tissue because if you say you use um, yellow and blue, 
and um, its bleeding tissue, both are going to lose color and you're basically going to end up with a green. Whereas when you have non-bleeding tissue, you're probably going to have like a blue and, well, a yellow greenish tone because the blue is going to shine through a little so the the lighter color is can, going to take on a little of that darker color so um, probably you you won't have yellow blue but you will kind of have this yellow green and maybe a blue with a slight tint of green in it uh, but you will still have two different colors um, which is very nice and that's not possible with bleeding tissue um, that kind of totally strayed away from the question but um, the answer is, I think you should try it out. It really depends on which glue you're using. And I've never used a pure uh, MC, so I don't know. And kind of, you know, perhaps go for the consistency of egg white, a bit thinner or a bit thicker, up to your taste. Uh-oh. I hope Felix is going to not cry too much. <laughs> I just heard him. Um, Next question comes from Wendy in Austin. Hi, Sarah. Um, first, thank you so much for sharing your origami knowledge with the community. You're welcome. It's always a joy. It's, um, I'm very happy to do so. And I think it's a privilege that it's possible and so easily possible nowadays with the internet. And now um, Wendy is asking, I'm interested in learning how to follow a crease pattern, but I don't know where to start. So, um, there are a couple of guides online and um, there's actually a post in the origami forum I, I'm kind of a member at but currently I'm not really reading a lot on the forum because I don't have enough time but for a time for a while I was actually regularly there and reading a lot and there's a, a sticky uh, thread there with kind of advice on how to start on crease patterns. And that's probably right now the best um, pointer I can give because um, I'm not really good at folding from crease pattern either. <laughs> I, um, I admire the people that do and I haven't tried a lot yet, I have to admit. Like for me it's, mm, I, I always think to myself, there's so many great diagrams out there and I can't even fold all those models that I want to fold. So I very, very rarely actually take um, a somewhat more sophisticated model where there's only a crease pattern and try to fold it from crease pattern. Um, the general advice to get started with crease patterns, I guess, is that you kind of look at some very basic shapes and you unfold them and you look at uh, the structures. And maybe you also take the folded model and you color different areas and then you unfold them and then you kind of see um, how, um, how the crease pattern relates to what's visible in the end. And, um, and this is a good exercise for basic things like uh, the bases, like um, well, the water bond base um, or the preliminary base, it's kind of the same thing just the other way around but also the bird base is more interesting or the fish base and when you kind of see those structures and when you understand them and then you look at crease patterns for more advanced models you can recognize them and then you know oh I'm right here I'm going to have to fold a bird base or something similar to a bird base or oh this looks like um, box pleating this looks like a sink or a double sink or something like that and I guess that's a good way to start. And of course, um, as with diagrams or um, in general with origami, you always start with something very simple. So if I see a model with a very simple crease pattern, then it's no problem for me to fold it because, you know, it's just a couple of creases. Um, it's usually quite easy to figure out how to add the creases and you just print it and you actually score the paper. And then you just uh, go along and, and try collapsing it. So, um, for example, the last model I folded from crease pattern is this um, this box. I was thinking of making a video for it, and um, I guess I can open it. It's a bit tough. I used very thick paper for this one, um, and it's kind of one sheet, although it was uh, a closed box. You can see that. I think it's really neat. Um, and um, if I unfold it completely, you just have to give me some time. I guess I should show that it's actually that model. And this is uh, something I'd say 
that is a very uh, simple crease pattern. You can kind of see a couple of diagonals. You can see a grid, a couple more diagonals right here, and there you go. And something like that is like uh, I think totally doable with no experience with void crease patterns by just um, kind of applying common sense. Um, this, by the way, is a one-piece twist box by I don't know how to pronounce her name yet. I guess um, uh, a nine um, Cleve Christensen from Sweden, and um, I've been in touch with her. And maybe there is going to be a video. We'll have to see. Um, but like, if you haven't done anything uh, with crease patterns, don't start with something that has a quite elaborate crease pattern. But start with something quite simple, and then I'd say go on to um, perhaps folding some a little more advanced models, like still simple, probably maybe low intermediate. Fold those, unfold them, look at the crease pattern, and and then try to kind of understand how if you just had the crease pattern, how you'd go along. It's kind of like when you have all the creases made, you unfold everything, and then you try to collapse it. It might uh, work quite differently than from diagrams, because with diagrams, you know, the designer or the person that diagrammed it put a lot of thought into kind of making this step-by-step -step process that then gives you all these neat creases without having to do all the pre-creasing and then all the collapsing. So it's going to be quite different. Um, so although I don't uh, have a lot of experience with crease patterns, I hope that helped a little bit. And after this um, Hangout on Air, um, I'm going to add a link to the forum that has much more advice. And there's like whole guides on what people think helps. And there's so many people that fold from crease patterns that are excellent at it and um, who I think can give much better advice <laughs> than I can. But Wendy, I hope uh, that helped a little bit. And um, let's go on to the next question. So me from somewhere, <laughs> which sounds quite anonymous, I guess, um, is asking, where can I buy paper um, that is good to fold with that's as big as one square meter or 36 inches by 36 inches um, to fold, for instance, the clownfish and uh, sea anemone, uh, anemone, uh, anemone, uh, I don't know. I had I tried to pronounce this with JC on VC, <laughs> and I, I failed miserably. So anyway, the clownfish and uh, the sea, you know, creature plant thing from JC Nolan's book, Creating Origami. Um, I have um, folded from such a big sheet once, which was. Um, Uh, which was the koi, which is right here. Yay! You might have seen the um, time lapse. It's kind of sitting on my shelf. And I think I have one more sheet left. Um, so I do have uh, one more sheet uh, of this one by one meter. Um, and I can't show it on camera, obviously, because it's too big. Maybe I can, actually. Ha! So there you go. Uh, that's a meter by a meter, which doesn't help a lot in answering the question. But um, it might make a couple of you envious, I guess. <laughs> um, I bought this in a specialist paper shop, actually. And they kind of had these big rolls of paper and um, I think online, I don't know, you can probably get it like for business uses or something like that. Um, but probably your uh, best chances are with buying it locally in, um, in such a, a store, which um, either is specializes in paper, um, this is Japanese paper, or, um, or kind of with office supplies, and, and then they often have these huge rolls, like really thick, and you can buy the whole roll, of course, but usually you won't, you, but you can kind of buy it by the meter. Uh, so I went there and I, I bought it by the meter. I bought two meters, or I think I probably let them cut to, to almost squares. And um, uh, online, I have no idea. Like, um, 
Nicola Terry, who has like a lot of large sheets, uh, doesn't carry that large sheets. Um, and uh, I, I just say you should try to find like one of those big um, office supply stores and check whether they have big rolls of paper. And then um, if they have them hanging there, you can feel them and you can see whether that works well for paper. Um, this is actually, I didn't treat it before folding with it and it was quite um, soft, too soft actually for my, um, for my taste. Uh, but it still worked out for the koi. I mean, that's why I also used the iron <laughs> because it made the paper a bit stiffer because when you fold paper, um, then after a while it gets a bit um, moist a bit humid, I guess. Um, we all have, even like, I don't really have sweaty hands, but when you fold and you touch the paper a lot, it's going to affect the paper. And um, kind of getting rid of that moisture um, actually helps stiffen it up. Um, so if you ever are folding a big project and uh, you feel like the paper is getting quite softish and it's still relatively flat, then, you know, maybe use um, an iron <laughs> to um, get rid of that moisture by heating up the paper and also uh, it strengthens the creases it's like the the super bone folder um, plus <laughs> um, so yeah try to find something locally I don't have an online resource and obviously locally um, well if you're in Munich uh, I got this from uh, Kata Pura um, a wonderful paper shop um, it's very, very difficult not to spend a lot of money. Um, and it's one of the recommendations I give everyone who kind of emails me and says, like, hey, I'm coming to Munich, which shops should I visit? And I say, like, Kata Pura. But, you know, be very careful how much money you spend. Um, they have beautiful papers, not just for origami, like generally papers. They're not really an origami shop. But they are definitely uh, a shop for book binders and, and paper lovers in general. Um, right, so uh, the next question is, now I'm not sure whether in between it jumped. So I've got that, I've got that. What is a good ratio for MC? Mine always turns out too thick. Um, is a question that kind of was added later by Quinn from Phoenix. And um, kind of related to what I said before, uh, if it's too thick, uh, just add more water. It's not going to hurt to add water as you go along. And uh, I don't have an exact ratio. If you feel that it's too thick, uh, you know, just go ahead, add more water until you feel comfortable with it. And if it um, turns out too thin in the end and the sheets don't stick together, uh, I don't think there's any harm in going over it again with glue. So too thin shouldn't be an issue. Um, you just have to be careful. I will add that if it's too thin and the paper is too wet, um, that you might rip uh, the paper if you're not careful. Um, but you always have to be careful when you're doing double tissue to not rip the paper by being too, too rash or moving too quickly or um, applying too much pressure, I guess. Um, so I think that's one I actually managed to answer quite quickly. <laughs> Could you do a video on the best way to cut paper? I'm thinking of buying a pack of large tanned paper to fold modulars, but I want to cut each sheet um, into lots of little ones. Should I cut along folds? I have a guillotine, but I'm, I'm not sure how to use it. Folding along um, Creases is very difficult and usually inaccurate. So um, if um, if you uh, cut by hand um, and you do want to cut along a crease, um, so I've kind of got a ruler here and I just need some kind of sheet. Um, let's see. Um, just a second. So, as I said, I didn't prep this, <laughs> but I, um, I should easily be able to find just some random paper. So, if you do fold um, a cut along a crease, never, please, never, with a, gui uh, a guillotine, whatever, the, the 
the trimmer where you can kind of chop down. Um, never uh, cut along a crease. It's not going to work uh, that well in my experience. Um, but if you um, cutting with a ruler um, and you don't want to measure a lot, then what I'd suggest um, if you want to cut along a crease is uh, you have the crease and what I do is I actually let the ruler slide exactly into that crease and then I cut along the um, uh, along the ruler and that kind of that sliding it into the crease um, ensures that it's quite accurate so in that way cutting along a crease is okay but you always um, cut on the valley fold side cutting on the mountain fold side is going to be much harder and much um, less accurate generally though I I would recommend if you want to have good precision is um, you measure and then you may maybe make two small tick marks and and then you kind of um, check that. That's not going to be so useful if you want to fold, uh, cut a lot. So if you do have a, a guillotine um, cutter, like it's messy over there, I'm sorry for that, but um, uh, you can see mine here. This is a guillotine and you know, you cut down and you can uh, cut several sheets of paper at the same time, but it's going to be a little less accurate um, unless you're very careful. And, um, and for that, for small, uh, for small squares, I think it's difficult to work precisely enough to get results that you're really happy with. Um, it depends a bit on um, which one you have, like this one um, has a guide that you can slide out and there you can quite nicely get good precision for um, even for narrow strips, um, but it's difficult. Um, I don't know how small they're supposed to be, um, but like if it's just like two, three, four, maybe even five centimeters, uh, it's going to be difficult to, to get it so precise that you'll have very accurate squares, which you probably want when you're folding modulars. Five centimeters might be okay, but below it's difficult. And me personally, um, if I want to go um, along that route, then I would cut by hand and you can cut several sheets of paper on top of each other. What I'd then do is I'd um, probably um, take like a whole pack and then I'd um, um, maybe put a sheet on top and on the bottom of some printer paper or something, something that you're um, not going to be sorry uh, when it's kind of not usable after that. And uh, tape it all together so that um, the paper can't move. There's no um, easy way for it to slide. So you probably want um, to have it wrapped very tightly on both sides and then perhaps also in the other direction. And uh, then it's not going to slide a lot and then you can kind of try to cut all of the strips in one direction and then in the other direction. Um, now that might be um, a, a little less work, but then you really have to have a very sharp cutting knife and um, then you, you cut layer by layer in some ways. You won't, you shouldn't put so much pressure on it that you try to go through 10 layers at once, but rather you can kind of cut and you're going to maybe go through two or layers or so, and then you're going to continue cutting, continue cutting until you're through all the layers. Um, that's going to give you more precise results than when you actually put on a lot of pressure. Um, it, it doesn't work so well. Uh, I have cut um, a lot of paper by hand before I had my cutter, and um, I did for, like I cut uh, elephant hide, large sheets of elephant hide for a friend and I ended up with like over a hundred um, squares uh, that I uh, then sent off. I actually don't know how many 
um, how many squares there were, but it was like it was like uh, a good chunk um, of elephant hide, and um, I worked um, to get it quite precise, and I think it worked quite well. And that was just with a ruler and and a cutting knife. And um, in my experience, um, or perhaps with my experience of folding, um, of cutting, sorry, of cutting with a ruler and a knife. Um, I found that it's it's easier to get precise results with that compared uh, to uh, a paper cutter uh, and a guillotine cutter. Um, although I guess what I will mention is hopefully if you have such a device right here, um, you can see this this kind of presses down the paper um, so that it doesn't move while you're um, cutting. And that's very important. So uh, if if you're not using that while cutting, then the results are going to be very imprecise. And if you don't have something like that, then you can perhaps kind of try to get something um, very close to the blade to actually press down the paper so it doesn't move a lot. I've also um, I have a friend who um, who's into book binding and stuff like that. And she actually said that she also, like uh, next to the blade, there is this tiny little space and um, it can be difficult when you kind of pull down the blade that you get a precise cut because there is a small, slight um, height difference. And it's just going to be like uh, below, uh, it's going to be much less than a millimeter difference, but it might make a difference to you. Like even half a millimeter can be too much imprecision for you. And she actually kind of added something that kind of evened out that uh, small difference in height so that she would always get nice precise cuts. Um, I have a couple of friends that, you know, they they cut a lot of paper too. And um, and with practice, they, they sometimes have like 20 sheets stacked on top of each other and then they, they cut through all of them, like as I said, kind of layer by layer and makes it much faster um, when, for, when cutting with a ruler and um, a, a knife. And with the guillotine, um, you can potentially also cut a lot more and um, again, going over there, I kind of have this... Um, where is it? It's actually not attached right now. There's a guide which you can kind of move back and forth so that you can always kind of press your paper against it so you always have the same size and that's very useful. In uh, First of all, if you're folding, um, if you're cutting a lot of paper, you kind of can always cut the same length. But also if you actually want a perfect square, um, it doesn't necessarily um, really matter whether it's exactly to the millimeter, um, five centimeters, let's say, for a small one. But it is um, very important that it's exactly a square. So if you, f um, if you cut in one direction and then you just turn that strip that you created and you cut it with the same guide, it's going to be pretty much a perfect square um, because you actually didn't change um, the the amount you're going to be cutting and all you really need to uh, really care about then is that you get a right angle and um, again here there's kind of this guide and if you press the paper against the guide you can be sure that you will have a 90 degree angle um, so those are kind of some points and I don't know perhaps um, I will be able to um, make um, a video explaining that I'm not sure and I'm not sure whether the explanations I gave which was just from the top of my head helped um, at all but I hope it did and I think I spent enough time on the questions now um, from Snus but in Newcastle um, upon Tyne I guess that sounds like England or at least the United Kingdom um, and I, I hope that helped a little bit and if not um, Perhaps you can drop me an email and um, I can try to dig out some resource or something like that. Okay, next question. Let me qu first see whether um, uh, any more questions were here. Daniel from Vienna asks, Hi Sarah, you said 
even failed some diagrams. I was wondering what models do you think are the hardest for uh, which there are diagrams of it. Even failed some diagrams? Was this during this hangout? Uh, I was wondering what models do you think are the hardest? Well, um, there's there's different kind of hard for diagrams. There's hard because the diagrams um, aren't polished enough. That makes um, some things very hard to fold, although they're not that complex. And then there's just the super complex models, which are really hard to fold, um, even though um, excellent diagrams exist. Um, for the most um, very complex models, I think um, crease patterns are given. Um, and some designers actually put uh, a huge effort and amount of time into actually drawing diagrams. So um, one of the obvious um, names to mention is Satoshi Kamiya, who is definitely a super complex uh, designer um, who does do diagrams and um, I guess, let me see. Um, Satoshi Gamiya. So, um, you know, if you don't know uh, who I was talking about, it's, it's the guy that designed the ancient dragon. And um, he does excellent diagrams for extremely difficult models. Um, and he's the first um, person I can think of. But uh, having said that, there are quite a few other designers um, of super complex models who do diagrams. But I haven't folded a lot of super complex stuff because it takes a lot of time. And time is something I don't have a lot of, um, especially recently. Um, so, yeah, um, there's a couple of other names I can think of, but um, I always have a hard time pronouncing the names. Uh, the most difficult uh, model I folded is probably the Ancient Dragon, um, with respect to uh, complexity of the design. Um, it's not the model I spent the most time on. That was the Koi with the scales, but it's not, um, it's not really difficult to fold. It's just very time consuming. <laughs> um, OK. Um, can you show us some of your paper um, asked by Quinn in Phoenix? Um, I've done a couple of paper giveaway videos, I guess, where I've showed some paper. Um, I can kind of, let's see how much of this is on screen. Uh, you can see right there is kind of this big shelf of paper. And then turning even further, there is this um, rack of papers. So um, so this is Star Dream and Star Dream and Star Dream. And let's see. then here, there's a translucent paper. And then elephant hide, elephant hide, elephant hide. Um, so that's all of these quite large sheets. Um, then up here is mostly Nicola Thierry uh, tissue foil and um, the Luxe Washi and big sheets of tent and uh, the um, uh, Anrayo, or however you pronounce it, which I just put over there, and some, some random other paper. Over here, there's, um, let's see, here is non-bleeding tissue, um, and here is bleeding tissue, so I actually separated it. I wasn't really showing paper, I guess, but I kind of was showing what's where in my shelf. So I was saying, 
uh, tissue, tissue, and big sheets. Uh, here it's a lot of, well, not the boxes. The boxes kind of wander back and forth. But there's um, oil papers here. Here's some handmade paper. Over there is actually also some handmade paper. Uh, down here is some um, templates to cut. And here are kind of the, um, the smaller sheets. Like all of this is big sheets. And then the boxes kind of have smaller sheets, like 15 centimeters or 6 inches, um, and stuff like that. And, you know, I kind of have, I have quite a big collection of paper, but hey, uh, that's me. <laughs> Actually, a lot of people I know that do origami uh, have a, a similar paper obsession with lots of paper. The good thing is that, um, you know, as time goes, I, I use this and that paper, and sometimes I have paper for like a long time, and then I I kind of uh, don't give it a try, and then I try it out, and I think like, wow, that's amazing! I have to fold more with that, and I kind of go on a frenzy with folding with that paper, and then you know, as I go along, I I go back to some other papers I know, or um, I discover another paper that I I actually bought and. And I didn't um, give enough uh, attention to yet. Um, so let's see. Um, I did that. I did this question. Can you show us some of your paper? I hope I kind of showed it. I, I guess really showing it on camera is going to be too time consuming because I kind of have to drag it out. Um, I can show you this paper, which was the one from the crease pattern. Doesn't look like it, but it's elephant hide. I, I painted it with uh, acrylic paint uh, to kind of make it look a bit like um, metal, and I like the effect. Um, it changed the cha uh, the folding quality a bit, but um, but it's still um, as sturdy as ever because it's elephant hide. Um, Could you do a video? I answered that. Can you make a tutorial for Roman Diaz's unicorn from origami essence? Uh, asked from Quinn in Phoenix. Um, I've been asked that question quite a lot. Uh, I haven't folded the unicorn. I also haven't asked Roman Diaz what he thinks about me showing a second model from his book. So um, I can't answer. Um, I think it's probably a quite um, advanced model. Let me quickly check. I mean, uh, what you probably can't see, but I can maybe show, is um, over here next to the papers. If you kind of weigh the papers, let me see. If I take away the papers. Um, this is my origami bookshelf. It's full of origami books and nothing else. And uh, there's not enough space to hold all my origami books anymore, which is quite a shame, which means kind of I've started stacking them and kind of not all put them in the shelf yet and whatever. But most of the, models, uh, most of the books are in there. And um, let me just quickly check that this paper is hanging all right. Um, origami essence should be here. It's uh, all ordered by a very specific kind of ordering of um, authors, where they're from, their names, whatever. Um, like the Japanese books are all in a different shelf, and the German ones are in a different shelf, and and then all of the ones that Nicola Terry published are in one. So uh, this is origami essence, one of my favorite books because I love uh, the design aesthetic of Roman Diaz and also kind of uh, his folding sequences are absolutely beautiful. And there's a unicorn here on page 121. And as this kind of gives difficulty ratings and how long it might take to fold, no, it says level 4, 35 centimeters and it has Actually, not that many steps. 81 steps. Uh, I haven't folded it yet, so I think complexity-wise, it might be doable. Uh, just looking through the diagrams now, I'm, I've gotten quite 
good at scanning diagrams to judge the design, I guess, uh, because I don't have that much time to fold, but I have a lot of time to, not a lot of time, but it doesn't take very much time to quickly scan through diagrams and kind of get a good feeling of um, what the design is about. So it might be possible to do the video uh, from that standpoint, but I'd have to fold it and I'd have to get in contact with Roman Diaz. I have um, a list of models um, that I am thinking about trying to make a video on, which kind of also includes getting permission. Um, and um, I think that model is already on the list. So um, keep your fingers crossed, it might work out. Not this year, but then again, there's just one more video this year, so <laughs> whatever. Um, maybe next year um, I can try and ask him, him because the book's been out for a while now and I try to not make more than one um, model from a book when the book is very new because I actually want to have people buy the book because uh, the designers put uh, so much work into drawing the diagrams and publishing a book that I, I want to promote the sales and um, they're never going to get the money that um, they deserve for the work they do. Um, but I think a bit of recognition and kind of seeing that the uh, book is bought and getting a little bit of money out of it um, is something that, um, that that is good and that really should happen and should happen more. So making too many videos from a new book to me seems like being competition to the book rather than promoting the book. Um, so that's why in the beginning I definitely said no, it's not going to happen for now. But now um, some time has passed, so I'm, I'm going to think about it again and see that maybe next year I, I can ask uh, Roman Diaz what he thinks um, of the idea. Um, I also don't know how... Um, I think I read recently that it's currently out of print and maybe if I did another video, there would be enough attention for there to be a second printing or another printing. I don't know how often uh, Nicolas Thierry actually did a reprint. Um, and if I did another video, maybe it would kind of give another push of, you know, getting those books sold. I was wondering, where do you buy all your paper and how much does it cost you from Vin in Ireland? Um, I think I asked, answered this question like for this tag origami and I forgot my answer again. I, um, I, I buy paper in locally and in origami shops. Um, most of the paper I buy online, I buy from origami-shop.com um, from Nicolas Thierry. Um, but I also sometimes buy from societies, like for example, I've bought from the British Origami Society Supplies Shop, which is supplies.britishorigami.info. Uh, and um, I don't think I've bought from many other online shops, actually. I've bought from Amazon once or twice, uh, which wasn't too bad. And um, and locally, I like to kind of, even when I'm traveling, I like to go into shops and kind of see, um, have a look around and then, then grab some paper, like um, from Vienna, I said I, I bought some, some tissue paper. <laughs> and um, even when traveling in Germany or, or when going somewhere, um, at conventions, like the, the, a lot of paper I have, I bought at conventions, uh, at origami conventions. There's usually these stores or shops or whatever um, with books and papers. And I have bought massive amounts of paper because those are then usually quite specialized for origami. And um, sometimes they have paper that's very hard to get online. Um, and then it's, um, it's like a special treat. Um, so those are the three areas, online and then locally just by browsing through shops. There's sometimes there's wrapping paper that's excellent, even now that I'm kind of a bit um, uh, spoiled with excellent paper um, or having bought excellent paper. Um, 
even now, sometimes wrapping paper is excellent for folding. Um, it just depends. I guess with time you kind of get this feeling of what paper uh, feels right and then you just give it a go. Um, and for example, for, um, for my wedding I did a lot of models and th those were folded from wrapping paper. And I wouldn't have had any problem with uh, spending a lot of money on the paper for my wedding. But it turned out that that wrapping paper, which was really cheap, was just the perfect thing I could find. Um, so um, it doesn't have to be expensive to be um, excellent. It doesn't have to be specialized. Sometimes something uh, very simple works um, um, even better some than some uh, of the really expensive stuff. Um, have you ever folded any models from the book Origami Design Secret Second Edition? And do you have the book by any chance? Yes, I have the book. Um, this was asked by Oridom66 in Baltimore. Um, I can show you. I can show you both editions. Up. <laughs> Heavy book. So uh, these are the two editions. The dark one is the second edition, and um, I I can say I have folded models from the book Origami Design Secrets. I haven't folded any models from the second edition that aren't in the first edition, but I have, for example, done um, um, an instructional video for the baby <laughs> that was I. I think the last model from this book uh, that I folded, um, and that's in both books. So yes, I have folded from uh, models from the second edition, and the koi obviously, which I folded, is in both editions, um, and the songbird and uh, the cuckoo clock, the black forest cuckoo clock, and um, and maybe a couple more. But uh, it's oh the Valentine. I did a video on the Valentine too. And uh, there's, you know, a lot of um, amazing models in there, but I haven't, I haven't explored um, the, the I haven't folded the um, models from the second edition that aren't in the first edition. Um, again, simply because I haven't had enough time. Like, I have so many books, and some of them I just haven't uh, had the time to. Um, explore and appreciate as much as I would like because, you know, um, my life isn't just origami. Even though perhaps uh, when you follow my channel, you you might think it it's mostly about origami, but it's just origami is a hobby, and um, most of my life is about um, family and friends and, and and work and and kind of getting other things done. Um, and and origami is just like um, a pastime when you know when I have a couple of minutes um, for myself. Um, or of course when I go to conventions, it's kind of a lot of social um, interaction and and fun stuff. Um, origami isn't just for myself. Actually, most um, mostly origami for me is about connecting with people and friends and you know YouTube is kind of also about connecting with people even though it it often may seem a bit one-sided because you know I'm recording I'm by myself even now I'm talking to you but I'm by myself here and and then again I I'm kind of trying to to bring us together a bit more with something like this kind of where you have the um, uh, the opportunity to to ask me questions and I can kind of try to talk about things uh, that interest you and um, and I kind of can go blah 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 rather than um, than folding um, although I I have often been told that I talk a lot during my folding videos too but then it's just um, because I want to explain what I'm doing and I always think you can um, not listen or mute a video if it's too much talking, but if you need uh, or if you're interested in more information on what I'm doing, then you know um, it's not possible to to add the audio if I didn't actually record it. Um, so let's see. Um, there is a second page. Um, Andrew 
from Davis asks, oh, I love this question, even though it was downvoted quite a lot, I don't know why, how do online origami communities like those on YouTube or Flickr fit in with national and regional origami groups? Where do you think this relationship might go in the future? Um, so I could probably talk a lot about this question and I, I thought about it a little. Um, but not a lot. And it's, it's a very difficult uh, question to answer. I will say that in some ways, um, you know, there's a quite a lot of, well, not quite a lot, but there's a good handful of people doing quite good videos now on YouTube. Um, and I guess one of the things that distinguishes me from them is that I'm uh, quite active in the um, in in the origami world outside of YouTube. I'm, I'm quite active there. I kind of go to conventions. Um, I sometimes write articles. I'm an editor for Origami USA's online magazine, The Fold. Um, kind of, I'm quite involved there too. And um, and I found very often the, the main contributors um, in YouTube are very different to those uh, that are uh, the main contributors to the offline origami world, I'm going to say. <laughs> but I think um, in more recent times, in for perhaps the, the last year or so, um, I think it's, it's starting to grow together a bit more. So for example, there are some designers that um, have YouTube channels who are presenting like the most prominent example example um, is probably Jeremy Schaefer who has now a quite successful channel because he's doing a lot of uh, fun videos showing some of his designs but before that there was Tom Hull and there's Stefan Weber who also did quite a, a couple of videos and um, there's some uh, some other designers that kind of present their their models um, which I think is a, a fantastic development so I think it's kind of um, in some ways growing together, but I, I also do think that there's a lot of people on YouTube um, watching videos that aren't involved in the um, in the national and regional origami groups, um, as well as there's um, surely a lot of people that are involved in those kind of groups who don't um, don't follow YouTube. Um, but um, in some ways, I hope that if people start folding with YouTube, they might actually um, be interested in meeting people in real life uh, to fold together and kind of have more of that social aspect. So I'm hoping that, you know, through online, they kind of go towards the offline um, origami world too. Maybe visit a convention, for example. And um, as to the people that are mostly involved with uh, um, societies and, and conventions, stuff like that. I have um, the feeling that a lot of them do um, quite a lot of um, uh, stuff online, be it uh, them showing pictures or them watching videos or them downloading diagrams from, from websites. Um, a lot of designers have websites. Um, many of them kind of feature diagrams. Um, and uh, for sure, I know that when I go to a convention, quite a lot of people um, know me from my videos, and I'm usually very surprised and humbled um, because they say, "Oh, I know the, your videos; they're they're very excellent," or they uh, they know my name at least, which is um, uh, still quite surprising for me when, you know, um, I go up to a designer and, you know, I, I respect them very much and I'm, I'm very honored and I kind of, um, um, I just want to say thank you in some ways or I want to um, ask them something or have a short conversation and it turns out they actually know who I am and I go, I'm, I'm a bit shocked, <laughs> I guess. Um, so I do know that um, there is quite a lot of um, interaction in some way going on, on already. And with respect to Flickr, I'm not really much on Flickr, but I do know that um, 
there's another whole community there of designers publishing pictures or people publishing photos and kind of connecting there. And I think in some ways there, the connection to um, regional and national origami groups and the offline um, origami world is stronger than with YouTube. Because um, I, I think it's kind of this platform that kind of grew from the offline world onto the online world, whereas YouTube is kind of this community that um, that formed by itself and now is kind of starting to grow into it. So I think there's kind of a, a lot more potential for, for them to merge so that there's even more goodness. Um, I think uh, videos have a great potential to um, to bring in more people or to um, make it more understandable for people. I mean, that's why I started because I thought um, some things are very hard to fold from diagram or some people have um, difficulty learning how to fold from diagram. And if they don't have a regional group, um, then, you know, um, the internet is everywhere or you know almost everywhere in the world now so it kind of makes it much more approachable and then perhaps once you kind of get the hang of it maybe you're going to say actually um, perhaps I want to form a small regional group or perhaps there's a regional group that isn't too far away that I'm going to visit because I really want to start to get involved now um, I I think um, I, I stop here because I could continue talking about that for a long time. I think it's a very, very interesting question um, with um, so much to comment on, maybe so much to comment on that I may think about it more and maybe write an article about it. I'm not sure. Um, I, I'll have to see whether I can make some sense of it in, in my head and maybe ask some people for opinions. I think it it might make an interesting article. So thanks for that question. Um, me from somewhere asks, what advice can you give on wet folding? I've always wanted to try it, but don't really know where to start. Best paper technique, um, etc. cetera. Um, so wet folding, I guess there's a big mystery around it. And I, I think I still, in some ways, think there is a mystery around it. But um, actually, it's it's not that big of a mystery. Basically, um, I'd say there's two or three types of wet folding. So one type is you basically um, dampen the paper, and uh, you have to fold the model quite quickly. So you already have to know how to fold the model in some ways. And um, it just makes um, it a bit softer and more beautiful. And it just adds a special touch to the model. Um, and then uh, I think there's this other category of wet folding models that, um, that live from wet folding. They're only possible with wet, wet folding. And usually they're very minimalistic in the creases. And it's more uh, shaping almost from the start. It's, it's, uh, it's not this exact folding sequence you don't um, often don't really have uh, exact references and exact steps but it's more like uh, getting the right feeling across uh, I think uh, um, uh, Jin Ding um, who is like an amazing origami artist uh, he's really an artist he, he's not just a designer or a creator but he he does works of art um, I think many of his models are kind of that second type of uh, not really references. It's more kind of capturing the the right feeling and the kind of getting that ex expressiveness in without doing that many creases, but doing a lot of shaping and that with dampened paper. So there's kind of those two categories. And the first one I think is um, is not as mysterious and you kind of, you probably should try it with dry paper first. And then once you kind of know how to fold it, then you can fold it with um, slightly damp paper. 
um, and then you can make it softer and add shaping and it's going to be when it's dry quite robust and quite beautiful. Um, best paper is a paper that when it's damp is not going to rip, it's probably going to be slightly heavier. Um, and um, elephant, uh, elephant hide is definitely suitable. You might use aquarel paper which is you know for painting aquarels. You can do that and you can even that kind of paper you can almost soak in the water. I, I have seen people soak it in water, take it out, fold a rose from it and it's beautiful. Um, but usually wet folding I'd say is actually slightly dampened paper and not actually wet paper, just to, to clarify that. Um, I think wet folding um, of the second category especially is a lot about trial and error and just giving it a try um, over and over. And I think it's also the more artistic um, area of origami. And with art it's kind of a lot. Um, there's this um, good explanation of a great photographer is kind of um, someone who um, selects the right pictures. It's not that they do just perfect shots, but they make a lot of pictures and then they have this great sense of editing where they can say that's the good picture, that's, that's the winner. Um, so I think with wet folding of the second category is kind of uh, similar. You kind of do a lot of it and after a while you kind of get a sense of what works and what's beautiful and the rest is just you know, um, we're practice pieces, I guess, in some ways. Um, and with wet folding, um, every piece is probably going to be um, unique. It's going to be slightly different um, because you don't have exact references. And um, it's not, the goal isn't to make uh, it possible to fold exactly the same thing. It's kind of giving it your own touch. And once you kind of go into that area of the, the artsy thing and not the more scientific area of origami, um, I think it's very hard to, to give um, hard advice in any case rather, other than this, you know, you know, practice, give it a go, which is always something I like to say because um, I think um, it's a bit of an adventure. You kind of, um, you should never limit yourself to kind of, just following rules. Sometimes you just should, should, should try and explore and see what works for you because different things will be pleasing uh, uh, to different people and different methods will work better or worse or you like them more or less and it's going to be different for every person. And in that sense I guess um, origami is even in, in the simpler forms and art. Um, Quinn asks, Quinn from Phoenix again asks, can you start doing paper review videos? Um, maybe, I don't know. Uh, now, uh, Ilan Garibi and Gary Vishne have started a great series of paper reviews, which are also available on happyfolding.com. Happyfolding.com, um, I don't know, even slash paper, does that work? Um, probably not. I can try it here. <laughs> Should maybe no, it doesn't work. Uh, but there's there's a link um, which oh, it's paper minus reviews underscore in introductions. Great. I should probably add a, a simpler link to memorize. <laughs> um, and there's like all this overview of lots of paper reviews they've done, and they've done an excellent job. Like. Um, quite scientific, always folding the same models and doing some um, some tests with machines and and those are great and I, I can really recommend them and I don't think I could nearly do as good as um, a job in videos um, but um, I can see whether um, perhaps I can do something along the lines, but I haven't thought about it and I'd have to think about a concept that to me makes sense where I say I'm actually adding value. I'm not, I try to produce content that I think adds value um, and not just doing things for the sake of publishing things, um, if that makes any sense. And um, I don't know where my my vlogs fit into that scheme, but I guess um, 
a bit of fun is also okay. So I think um, I've gone through all the questions from the moderator page. Let me quickly check. I've done that. I've done that. I've done that. I've done that. Um, I've done that. Yes. Yes. Uh, are there books from Michael LaFosse? Uh, are the books from Michael LaFosse a good place to start with wet folding? Um, Michael LaFosse does excellent books and he does excellent paper. I haven't met him in person, but I think uh, from everything I, I've heard of him and I've had some email contact, he's like a great person. Um, and he is definitely um, very good at wet folding and he brings that up in his books and he I'm not sure whether he's still selling them but he had some DVDs available that explained some wet folding too and I'm not sure there's a lot out there about um, wet folding in a very understandable way and Michael LaFosse definitely does very high quality content so um, I think um, it's it's truly uh, a good place to start with wet folding. I, I would advise that if you're folding Michael LaFosse stuff that um, has to do with wet folding that you uh, probably are a bit practiced in origami already because he has excellent designs but they're not always the easiest especially once you kind of go to wet folding. Um, there is one online video on um, I think it's pem.org let's see origami.pem.org see whether that works and I think he has yes um, well maybe not so there used to be online videos at least and one of the videos was um, on his uh, happy good luck bat I think it's called I'm not sure it's been a while and um, and that was actually wet folding um, so I'll try to see whether the video is still, still online and add a link um, once I archive the video and put it online. Um, but that might be a, um, a, a good pointer. And then there's the videos by Stefan Weber. He did, did some wet folding videos, although he didn't really, um, I think, explain a lot about wet folding. But perhaps he removed some of the mystery but by just saying, you know, I'm going to going to dampen the paper and then I'm going to fold. Um, he folds very quickly, obviously, when um, the paper is dampened because it dries. You know, time is an issue then. And um, he might also be um, a good place to start. Um, that's the other reference I can really think of. Other than that, um, why not just experiment? Like, uh, takes um, a damp, uh, a wet cloth and and go over the paper so that the paper um, is a bit damp or take like um, um, a mister that kind of sprays out this very thin mist of water and spray your paper with that and that that might also dampen the paper sufficiently and then just give it a go like there's no harm in trying and if, if you uh, don't um, succeed or if you're not happy enough the first time uh, just try again and um, and see how it goes and, and maybe read up on stuff um, online too. Or if you go to a convention, ask some people whether they have experience with wet folding and, um, and perhaps you can do like a small session together and see how it works. Um, those questions I answered. Um, yep. And I think I've gone through all the questions. So now, um, I've, I've gone on for quite a while now, but I, I am going to see what comments were left on the, the video stream and see whether there is anything here. Um, what's the hardest thing you've made? Uh, that's probably the Ancient Dragon by Satoshi Kami. I'm not entirely sure, but it's up there definitely. What's the prettiest thing you've ever made? Um, I don't know. I usually fall in love with a lot of models and I love a lot of them. And uh, Pretty. I really like... Um, 
I really like the Alexander Swallowtail Butterfly by um, Michael LaFosse. I do love it. I fold it a lot. I show it a lot. Um, and um, I really like doing that. Um, I mean, on the Happy Folding website, there's the uh, Mudari Luna Moth by Michael LaFosse. It's the first Michael LaFosse model I ever folded. It's the first time I wet folded, too. Um, and that was, I think, September 2007, so quite a while ago. And that is perhaps the most beautiful model I folded. I don't know, because it's from so amazing paper too. But um, I fall in love with so many models. I so often have things that I think is, are really pretty and beautiful. Um, can you say hi uh, to me, please, to make up my day? Um, hi, Lone Soul, Soul, Lone Soul 0742. Hi. I hope that made your day. <laughs> Um, could you help me? I'm a very young origamist and my dream um, is to learn how to fold a crease pattern. So I kind of answered that question. Oh no, it's auto-updating. Uh, and I can't see the things that are marked as spam for some reason. I have to stop auto-updating. Apparently, I'm getting a lot of comments right now. So, so, when will it start? It already started. It hasn't started yet, right? Well, it started now, so question, question. Uh, error keeps occurring. Hmm. Maybe someone was having difficulty joining. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, Deshna. I hope you made it. Um, um, how should I go about designing my own origami? I'm not really a designer. I've designed uh, like two or three designs, something like that. Usually, once I really attempted to design something, um, the other two times it was more like uh, once it was just experimenting and once it was I needed to have something and I just um, folded um, and I just doodled uh, around a bit until I had what I wanted and, and then went along with that, but it was really simple, like um, a heart from um, a bill because I wanted to give away a heart, which was for the wedding. And then later, um, again, I think I made up a different one just because I didn't know what I'd done the first time. Um, I think it's uh, there's different ways to designing your own origami. Either you kind of um, just doodle around um, or you kind of go more scientific and say I want something I'm going to try to get there um, I think it helps if you try to expose yourself to a lot of different designs um, and it, um, work by very many different designers very different diagrams to kind of pull the tools you need to design but that's again the more scientific approach I know a lot of people say like oh if I look at so many designs, it kind of limits my creativity. I prefer to just do my own designs. I don't look a lot at what other people do, and that's fine too. Um, generally, um, I really don't have an idea of what the best approach is. Um, and I currently, at least, have focused on teaching and presenting rather than designing. I just have that much time and um, I feel like there's a lot of people that are probably a lot better than me um, in designing uh, that uh, I don't know how much potential I have but I think there's a lot of people out there that have more potential and are, are actually already using it and I think uh, I have a lot of potential in um, in promoting and sharing that um, that love of origami through YouTube and through through stuff like that, and I'm kind of going along that route, and um, and I'm hoping. Well, you watching this, perhaps you appreciate that I I've decided to to focus on that rather than designing, and maybe um, at a later point I'm going to decide um, that a different focus is better, and maybe I'm going to design more. But right now. Um, 
the time I do have is going to be mostly focused on um, teaching. Uh, what advice can you give on wet folding? I've kind of gone through that. Um, I am from Colombia and I love origami. I want to make tutorials of other models and of my own models and my channel is starting. So I want you to help me to be a famous origami guy. Well, um, I guess um, I, I, I wish you much uh, success and good luck with origamis. I, I think the best route to um, being successful with origami videos is uh, doing it the right way. Um, in my opinion, this includes that when you're doing tutorials of other designers that you ask for their permission because you're going to make a lot of friends and you're going to learn um, a lot from them too. And um, I think it's just the right thing to do. Uh, to me, it's very important. People that don't ask permission, I think, aren't showing um, enough respect um, if they know, you know, that's the right thing to do and they choose not to do it. Um, the second um, aspect is trying to do um, videos that um, make it easy to follow along. And you have to decide what your um, target audience is. Is it like complete beginners? Is it very advanced folders? Um, um, is it a children? Is it adults? Um, what's your target audience? And kind of then um, decide um, on a teaching style that is um, going to be suitable for that audience. Like my videos are probably not suitable for um, many complete beginners, especially if they're children. I, I try to make things very understandable so that even complete beginners can fold them, at least with the simpler models, like the more difficult models. Um, yes, they're, they're, they're still going to be difficult. I try to make it very understandable, but you know, some things you just need to have practice with uh, folding paper. You need to be um, a bit experienced with how to handle paper. I try to show it a lot, but um, but showing isn't enough. Sometimes you actually need to have the hands-on experience. So um, that's probably the biggest advice I can give. Um, also, be patient. Um, I, I remember how excited I was when I had 50 subscribers and I'd done videos for a couple of months back then. Um, perhaps the competition wasn't as big as it is now, but I think there's still um, a lot of potential for, for other people to uh, create excellent videos and, um, and get a big followership. I think there's more and more people um, following origami videos. So, um, and you know, um, it takes time to produce videos. So, um, I think the people that are viewing always appreciate more high quality videos. Um, and I did write a, a guide with uh, some explanation on how I produce my videos. And those were published with the fold um, on the Origami USA um, website. And you may want to have a read through that and maybe draw um, some uh, points from that on how to do good videos. Of course, it's always um, your own decision what you do. And I tried to bring that through in the, in, in the guide that, you know, it's, um, I'm just explaining how I do things, but that doesn't mean it's the one um, good way of doing things. There's actually many ways um, in which you can uh, break my rules and uh, make uh, superb videos. Um, and I tried to give some examples, at least in one of the articles, kind of saying like, this person did a really great video. It's a very different style. It doesn't um, follow the guidelines I follow in my videos, but it's still excellent. So I think, you know, um, also if you do your own style of videos, you're always going to have this group of people that think uh, this is better than what someone else is doing because they just like it better. What is your name? Well, that's easy, Sarah Adams. Um, <laughs> uh, Deshna asks, oh, great. So you were able to, um, to view the video after all. Uh, I can't seem to advance uh, to advanced models. How do I approach 
um, how to approach these. Um, I'd say it's very difficult. It's a question I get answer, uh, asked um, often or relatively often. Um, always start with um, models uh, that are simpler and then kind of start to progress and um, try to pick a, a model you think looks nice and if it's too difficult then first spend some time with other models um, until you think you've progressed and then get back to that model. That's definitely what I did. Um, also slow down in your coding like um, fold the same model a couple of times until you think you kind of have a very neat result um, and you perhaps understood um, the folding sequence um, more than you did in the beginning at least. Um, every crease you make, um, don't rush through it, like don't matter how long did I need to take, um, how, how long did I need to fold a model, it's, um, it's not a race, right? Um, and if you want to have precise folds, then slowing down is often um, one of the most important things that you need to do. One of the biggest mistakes of people is that they rush through it. And when you do a small arrow, it, uh, arrow, it adds up. And with advanced models, it's going to bite you. Um, with experience, you'll also learn that sometimes very... Um, imprecision, intended imprecision is good. So sometimes it's good to leave a slight gap when you're folding so that uh, another crease will have space. Um, and um, and that, uh, that I think is not necessary to um, really advance to advanced models, but um, it is very helpful to get um, very clean looking models and very nice looking models and kind of that that touch and I've kind of tried to start and mention that in videos kind of saying like try to not um, to, to kind of leave a small gap here or there to kind of get a nicer result um, but um, other than that it's just you know be patient with yourself it's not a race um, and uh, fold what you enjoy and in my videos I try to in some ways explain some of the finer points of things that will make a difference especially when folding more advanced models that's kind of my thing like thinking about target audiences I, I, I was mentioning before it's like my motivation is actually um, teaching people how to fold um, origami not as in teaching them specific models but teaching them how to fold. So that's why I talk a lot and I show a lot and I kind of say, hold the model like this and then push there and it's kind of going to happen. Uh, that's kind of something I try to show because I think it's something that um, that isn't easily shown in diagrams and I kind of try to, you know, add value as I was saying. I try to, um, to offer something that um, isn't uh, as easily available and um, with different means, um, with other means, um, and and kind of that aspect of showing the hands and kind of describing that and movement and and giving that information, I think, is something um, that is difficult um, to put into diagrams or is very rarely done um, in diagrams. Um, what is your favorite paper and why? Uh, what is your favorite model and why? My favorite paper, uh, it depends on the model, definitely. Um, for tessellations, it's probably elephant hide. <laughs> um, for others, it's really too hard to say. It really, really depends on the model. There is not uh, one perfect paper. Um, it's just, and there's not the wrong paper, you, you, you can find, for almost every paper, you can find a model that's going to work really well with it. And it's, that's going to be really beautiful. I will say that um, for complex models, I think double tissue is very nice. I'm not as fond of um, tissue foil, although I know that many other people love it and fold a lot from it. Um, what is your model and why, again, I 
I really don't want to and I can't restrict myself to one model. There are some designers that I appreciate especially. Uh, for example, um, just seeing this book here, uh, Roman Diaz is one of the designers um, whose aesthetic I appreciate a lot. But uh, then there's Tomo Kofuse for, um, for many things and there's many designers. I'm, I'm not going to start listing more names now because there's a long list um, for very different reasons. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, one of my um, favorites of models that I folded very often, that I give away very often, um, is um, the Alexander Swallowtail Butterfly by Michael LaFosse. It's, um, it's relatively easy. It shows off the paper very nicely. Um, my husband says, I, I have to go to bed now. He sent me a chat message, actually. <laughs> so I'm just going to quickly scan through this. Uh, thanks for introducing me to origami. Um, do you have any advice for making origami tutorials on YouTube? That's the um, the guide that I I wrote. It's like a series of a couple of articles, um, and that's um, probably um, got a lot of advice on what I think works on um, YouTube. Uh, what was your first origami? Um, probably in kindergarten, like this cootie catcher model. Um, I'm saying howdy to Texas, howdy. Um, uh, Deshna asked the same question again. Um, I'm asked to speak a couple of German words. Uh, ja, ich kann Deutsch reden. Ich bin Deutsche und um, Im Englischen sage ich Happy Folding, auf Deutsch sage ich fröhliches Falten und ähm, ich hoffe, das ist genug Deutsch. Switching back to English, because most of you probably didn't understand anything, but I was just saying that while in English I say Happy Folding, in German I say fröhliches Falten, which translates to Happy Folding. Um, is a Hangout a video chat? I'm not going to start explaining Hangouts. Um, I don't have enough time. <laughs> I love your work, thank you. And my baby is adorable. I think so too. Um, wer ist alles Deutsch? That's not a question to me. That was asked. Uh, bleeding tissue, what is meant by that? It's if you if the paper is wet, it's going to lose color. My husband is in the background and he's looking at me impatiently. Um, Five more minutes. Hmm? <laughs> um, I'm going to finish it here. I think it's great that there's been so much excitement and I'm really sorry, but I see that there's tons and tons and tons of more comments. I'm going to try and go through them and answer them just on the um, YouTube page. Um, and we'll see if you're interested in perhaps another one of these sessions. Um, just let me know and I can see whether uh, I can arrange another one of them. Uh, for now, um, it's been much longer than um, I thought it would be, um, over one and a half hours now. And I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope I didn't embarrass myself too much with a lot of blubbering and ba 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 ba. Um, I hope you have a great night, a great day, or whatever um, time of day you have with um, with yourselves uh, wherever in the world you are. And I need to um, go to bed now. And um, I wish you happy folding and see you around. Bye bye.